Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, our webinar tonight from the Panky Institute. Uh, I am going to talk today about breathing and airway support, which is a little different than talking about dental sleep medicine. It's a little different than talking about oral appliances, the things that I teach a lot of and teach at the Panky Institute for the last several years. So we're going to talk about things that are that go along with snoring and sleep apnea, the things that your patients may be uh, wanting to talk to you about, and I'm going to give you some tools, some ways to talk about it. My practice in Bellevue, Washington, outside of Seattle is just this. That's all I treat is snoring and sleep apnea, and I work at this uh, for with the ADA and some other things. And so I'm going to talk to you today about all of that going forward. My uh, disclosures, um, you need to know what I do. I, I, I'm in touch with lots of things. And most importantly, I'm, I, I think, or most, the thing I'm happiest about is I'm the consultant to the American Dental Association for Sleep-Related Breathing Disorders. And now, not that important that I'm the consultant. I just like the fact that the ADA has a consultant for sleep-related breathing disorders because dentistry is paying attention. And dentistry is an important part of that, as you'll see coming up. I'm also chief dental editor for Dental Sleep Practice Magazine, and I'm in touch with lots of industry and do lots of things around. So you'll see my name in lots of places, but you're not going to hear about anything about sales today. And uh, so there's really no financial things. You can't actually buy anything that makes money for me except that book there, uh, Clinician's Handbook for Dental Sleep Medicine. If you buy that book from Quintessence or Great Lakes Dental Technologies or any place else you find it, then um, Dr. Ken Burley and I get to split $7.20. And so I, I thank you for all $3.60 that I get made uh, make uh, for buying that book. But that's the only financial thing I've got to tell you about. So the, it's, a, it's a big numbers problem in the United States. It, it's a billion people year worldwide, but in the United States, it's estimated at oh, 29, who knows how many, but lots of millions of people have some form of sleep-related breathing disorder. And it's cost the economy a lot of money. Uh, the a American Academy of Sleep Medicine a few years ago commissioned a big study, and they came up with this number, $150 billion in uh, various costs, direct healthcare costs. It costs indirect healthcare because of comorbid conditions. It costs loss of productivity of people at work. It costs the economy $150 billion per year in uh, sleep-related breathing disorder complications. And so there's no dispute about how big the problem is. But the, one of the difficulties we have is that the number of professionals out there that are capable of interacting with these folks who have breathing uh, disorders are not near enough. Currently, there's out of 7,500 or so sleep physicians, not all of them are practicing, not all of them are diagnosing, not all of them are trying to assess the problem. So we figure five, maybe what if it's six, but what if it's double that? What if it's 10,000 diagnosing physicians? It's still 29 million Americans, but there are 193,000 dentists. And out of that, we think there's a few thousand of us that are doing something pretty active for treating adult sleep-related breathing disorders. There needs to be many more, and, there, and we have plans for that, but it's going to be a routine part of dentistry as we go forward because the, of the numbers, because we're the only part of healthcare that can do something about children's airway, and we're the only part of healthcare that can add more services to our practice mix and be able to incorporate that into a steady workflow. Physicians are overworked. They have seven minutes per person. They don't have enough primary care doctors. There's a lot more dentists. Yes, we're working hard too, but we do have the capability of adding some additional services. And the, and the reason why is because the physiology of the patients that see us is the same physiology of the patients that see the physicians. And it's about hypoxic burden. Hypoxic burden is the challenge that the body physiology has to low levels of oxygen on an intermittent basis. And our bodies can handle this. We can hold our breaths. We can go uh, scuba diving. We can go up in an airplane. We can live at different altitudes. We have a lot of abilities to manage hypoxic burden, but we all have an adaptive capacity. And when that adaptive capacity is exceeded and our ability to manage through the changes to our physiology that come with low oxygen, then that leads to a chronic disease. And these aren't infectious diseases. 
These are chronic non-infectious diseases. These are diseases of inflammation. And so we have the term chronic sleep-related breathing disorders. Now, as we sleep, uh, most of us, thankfully, keep our airways open. Most of us have a patent airway behind our palate and our tongue. And so as we breathe, whether we're on our back or our sides, when we have an open airway, we can breathe through our noses at nighttime just fine and everything's good. But there's 29 million of us that don't do that. And those people have some form of obstruction in their airway while they sleep. We call that obstructive sleep apnea in the most serious level of diseases. We have other labels for different levels of obstruction, but we can all call we can call them all sleep-related breathing disorders because that's how they were defined, and that's how we measure them. That's when we measure them. That's the part of our physiology that is affected the most when we don't breathe well. Now, we do have breathing problems during the daytime as well, but we're going to talk about sleep-related breathing disorders. And this is a, a graph um, I snapped out of a uh, high-resolution pulse oximetry of one of my patients. And this is her SpO2. The graph at the top is 100. The, graph, the next line down is 90. And 90 is our threshold. We want to keep everybody's oxygen levels above 90. But you can see this patient didn't stay above 90 a whole lot. She was up and down across 90 quite a bit. She was below 90 a lot, and she was bouncing around a lot. This is a sleep-related breathing disorder. This causes intermittent hypoxia. So another way of labeling this is actually chronic-related, breathing-related sleep disorders. Because when she's not breathing well, and her tongue occludes her airway, or, and her oxygen levels drop, her brain responds. She, her brain that's supposed to be going through normal sleep cycles and, and getting a good restful night's sleep responds poorly. It responds with adaptive, adaptive capacity. It responds with compensations. It responds in many ways that don't add up to restful sleep. And if you do that long enough, then your body can exceed its exact adaptive capacity. So we've seen x-rays like this in our practices where we have condyles and we that are, look healthy, and then we have condyles that don't look healthy. And we wonder, how does this happen? What goes wrong with these bones that cause this much degeneration? And there's a ton of theories out there. I have giant books over there on the shelf that talk about that, and there's others I haven't purchased yet. There's whole courses about what goes wrong with these condyles. But one of the things that goes wrong with these condyles is a circadian rhythm disruption. Now, this is a study that was done just recently in uh, 2020, it was published. These are rat condyles, but the, they have traced it very carefully with the same biomarkers in, a, in humans. They haven't been able to you know, check on um, staining uh, sacrificed humans to look at their condyles, but they can watch the same levels of some of these blood chemicals, these blood reactive proteins. So they, they can correlate this with what goes on in, Houston, in humans. So what happened here is we have control rats at the top line, and we have uh, circadian rhythm disruption rats. Now, what they did here is the rats would have a normal sleep cycle, but these rats were interrupted from their sleep cycles, and so they couldn't get through a normal night's sleep. They couldn't get their brains to go through the pattern of sleep that, is, that was healthy for these rats. The third line is after four weeks, what they did is they took the disruptions away and they said, okay, grats, you go ahead and sleep the way you want to sleep, but we'll only bug you for four weeks, but at six weeks and eight weeks, we'll, we'll have let you alone for a couple of weeks. Now, what you can see here is the, the look at the little lines on the controls. That air, double arrowed line is the, con, is the cartilage layer over the rat condyles and look at it didn't change much in depth over the course of eight weeks. But if you look at the four week one, the six week one and the eight week one of the circadian rhythm disrupted rats, it's thinner at four weeks and it gets really thin at six weeks and stays that way across eight weeks. The red arrows on those two boxes indicate some disruption, some breakage in the condylar head covering of the condyles. And then uh, the third uh, line there with the recovery rats, four weeks of, of CRD. And so it's got thin, just like the other ones did. But then after they returned the rats to normal, they didn't recover. So the line still stays small. The disruptions, the breaks in the normal covering of the condyles were still there. <clears throat> so what do we take from that? 
we take from that that the earlier in life that we can establish good, healthy physiology and not disrupt it means the better chances we have of keeping those condyles forming well. When do humans' condyles form? In those early years of life. They're not fully formed when they're born. They're, they're fully formed somewhere around puberty. And in between those times is when those condyles are taking their good shape. So if we can establish good, healthy circadian rhythms, which means we don't interrupt them, then we have a better chance of growing human condyles that are going to have good solid structure and be able to withstand the problems later on. There's a lot of research that needs to be done about this, of course, but I wanted to show you a very clear example of how bad sleep uh, effect, directly affects structures that we pay a lot of attention to. Because we pay attention to good dental things. I mean, if somebody walks in our practice and has a ton of things that they need to get cleaned off their teeth, we can be very proud of what we can do to help health along those lines. And that's great stuff that we do. But while we're cleaning their teeth, if they have to interrupt us because they're yawning, if they can't keep their attention on us, if one of the complaints they have when they sit down and, and we visit with them about their health is that their days are filled with tiredness and fatigue, well, we need to start paying just as much attention to that as we do to the dental things that we were trained on in dental school, dental hygiene school, and other places. And that means we are partly responsible for the whole cranial facial respiratory complex. Dr. Kevin Boyd, my colleague in, in uh, Chicago as a pediatric dentist, he came up with this uh, label a few years ago, and I just love this label. I wish it was a little easier to say, but it does uh, reflect our whole scope of our uh, professional responsibilities. Now, this is a, a, an infant or a child's face, of course, but it really represents the whole thing. And as we take um, our place in medicine as it being in charge of the craniofacial respiratory complex, we get to affect growth and development. We get to affect how the body responds to uh, perturbations in this. We get to help train the body to swallow properly and grow good bone and good airway support. And that's the, the major role I think dentists are going to have going forward is a, in healthcare is looking at early in life to little ones and identifying those that, that have an underdeveloping craniofacial respiratory complex and doing the things that we can do and bringing in the other uh, folks in medicine that can influence this as well, like an ENT doctor or a myofunctional therapist or a speech and language pathologist or other people that can uh, help correct the things that we recognize are kind of going wrong. So this is our area. No other part of medicine pays near as much attention to the craniofacial respiratory complex as dentistry does now. And I, my uh, goal is to get dentistry to pay even closer attention to this. And why is that? Because of the mechanisms that chronic intermittent hypoxemia trigger to cause problems. Now, this is a complex slide. And I'll show, there's a lot more coming. And I'll show you that. But we're not going to pay a ton of attention to this. But what I want you to notice is that on the left side here, it says mechanism. The mechanism of chronic intermittent hypoxemia is airway obstruction. And another part of it is in increased intrathoracic pressure. Why would the pressure go up in the, in the thorax? It goes up because the body doesn't have an open airway. Be and it may not have an open airway because of anatomy, anatomy of the cranial facial respiratory complex. And when that starts to create uh, uh, breathing related sleep disturbances, then we have apnea and arousals, which means closing down of the airway and, and interruptions to the brain's sl uh, sleep cycles, which can interrupt circadian rhythm. And that creates in that complex of problems, uh, this intermittent hypoxia problem and something called sleep fragmentation. Now we go through our normal night's sleep and we're supposed to go through its normal light sleep, deep sleep, and, and some dream sleep or REM sleep. We're supposed to have these normal cycles. If we're interrupted, uh, say for example, if you have a new baby, say for example, if you have a new puppy or an old puppy, or you have breathing disorders and your sleep is interrupted frequently because of these things, you know you're not gonna get a good night's sleep. Ask any new parent out there about what their sleep quality is like. That's, all, that's the first thing they're gonna come up with is this fragmentation. They may not say fragmentation, but they'll say, I get terrible sleep because of the baby. 
Well, what if you weren't if able to breathe well through the night every night for decades? That's the same kind of interruption to your sleep. And so this inner hypoxia causes cause all kinds of problems. Now, the thing in the middle of pathophysiologic consequences, there's a lot of details there. And I can tell you right now that none of those details are good for you. The three that I've circled are kind of the worst ones of the bunch. And systemic inflammation is the thing that causes a whole lot of problems. But none of those responses, none of those adaptive responses, none of those compensations that are in that box of pathophysiologic consequence are in your best interest. If we have a body that's responding to this chronic intermittent hypoxia in these ways, after a, the adaptive capacity is... is um, uh, exceeded, now the body starts to break down. The compensation factors trying to keep the body alive ends up with these things on the right side of the of this page there. These things are insulin resistance. That's a, a giant problem in lots of people's physiology where their insulin is no longer able to manage blood glucose levels. And that causes some downstream problems that, that are chronic and, and increase the, the chances that they're going to die young. There's type 2 diabetes, there's stroke, there's uh, cancers, um, polycystic syndrome, all these different chronic diseases that folks struggle with, struggle to get diagnosed, struggle to get treated, struggle to pay for. All of these things are happening because of the exceeding of the body's adaptive capacity, and they've traced much of it back to this intermittent hypoxia. The respiratory drive that we have, the respiratory system, the things that come from gas exchange are the foundational bedrock of our physiology. We disrupt that and we allow the body to develop these other issues. And since the mechanism traces all the way back to anatomic abnormalities and apnea arousal cycles and airway obstructions, now we have ways to intervene to prevent these problems upstream. And when we can do that as dentists, then we get to help the body not develop these other negative components of health. And that's, I think, a powerful place for dentists to do. So the, the term is hypoxic burden. Now we measure uh, sleep-related breathing disorders in a term called apnea hypopnea index. It, it's the early numbers that the physicians that invented this disease could measure. They could watch the patient not breathe. They could watch the patient breathe poorly and they could measure how many times that happened and they have an index. Well, now we know that because of the science that uh, behind the physiology, that these breakdown problems aren't really related to how many apnea events they have. It's really related to how low does their oxygen go and how long a time has the body been dealing with this. So it's the changes in oxygen levels and it's the amount of time. And when we have those chronic inflammatory triggers of those two bits, then we end up with the negative consequences that you see on the screen there. So lots of things happen because of chronic inflammation. We can eat inflammatory diets, but if we breathe with inflammation, that's no, that's no good for us either. So what happens when the patient comes into the dental office, to your dental office, to your colleague's dental office, and they complain about some, some real common things? My mouth is dry all the time. I, and you look in there and there's wear on the teeth and they have gingivitis. They don't like that. They have bad breath. They have all these things. They, com they complain to us about that because these are oral problems and we're in charge of the mouth, aren't we? So we take a health history and we find, oh gosh, while well, you're taking these medications that are known to cause dry mouth. I think, I can't remember the number, but there's over a thousand medications that are commonly prescribed that have something to do with xerostomia. So the disruption to the autonomic nervous system that causes the body's mouth to dry up is a super, um, well, common uh, thing that happens with medications. So since we don't get to talk to patients about discontinuing their medications, we have to help them make up for dry mouth somehow. We see wear on the teeth that nobody else sees because that's our job, right? When, how do, why do most people think they have wear on their teeth. Why do most people think they grind their teeth? Why do most people think their teeth have gotten flatter over time and they'll blame stress? 
Now, stress is associated with it, but it's not pathognomonic and certainly not associated with everybody. But we see stress as commonly, and then gingivitis is most commonly passed off as poor oral hygiene. Not always true because each one of these things on this contribute to the other one. If you have dry mouth and grind your teeth, you're gonna, your enamel is going to get ground down a lot faster. If you have dry mouth, your gingivitis is going to be much worse. And if you put a lot of pressure on the system by grinding your teeth, then your, your gums are also going to be more inflamed that way. And that might progress even further into periodontitis if we, uh, if we have too much pressure and the wrong kind of bi microbiome, all the other components that make up complex oral disease. But when your patient walks in and see and you see these things, I want you to be able to expand your point of view and see not just these things, but also see airway issues. So when you walk in, the patient walks in and shows you these teeth. The upper right one, that wear is pretty common. We see that all the time, don't we? This patient has spent money and time and, and at the dentist's office to try and make up for it. Look at those crowns that are in there. Are they working out too well? Uh, did the crowns fix the problem or did the crowns just patch up a broken spot and then put themselves in harm's way for more breakage? That's what I see on that screen. So if you're, that patient walks in, now panky audiences, of course, you know, we're trained to look at these things and we see deeper than just the worn through teeth, the enamel, just the, the pitted areas, just the fractures and think, okay, what happened here? How did this get this way? What What's the background to this one? Why did this happen? What's, what is it that I can change so my crowns that I recommend don't end up looking like this in my office or somebody else's office later on? What about the upper left one? You see that, and what's your first thought? Is your first thought, wow, crooked teeth. You know, I got some bad feelings here. This patient may be walking in your office saying, I don't like the looks of my smile. And you see, you see crooked teeth and you see, well, and you start putting in your head, what can I do about this? Can I do clear aligners here? Am I going to send them to the orthodontist? What is it can I do about that? Are they going to accept orthodontics or don't, am I going to have to do something fancy with restorative dentistry to make this look right? What I want you to see is past this, and it's not quite a great picture, but look at the arch form. Look how narrow the maxilla is. If they were smiling, not just sitting there with their mouth open, do you think you could see much of the posterior maxillary teeth? Or would your eye stop at those cuspids because the other one teeth are, hit, are hidden behind there? I, I see a narrow maxilla. I see lower teeth. You can't see them too well, but you can imagine that those lower teeth are, are lingual verted. They're pointing inwards towards the tongue. What you really can't see, but I, my eye sees it right away, is that that tongue has indentations along the side. So when you have a tongue that is being pushed hard against the lingual surfaces of the enamel teeth, hard enough over the years to cause little indentations along the side, then you know that the body is trying to keep that tongue from falling backwards into the oral pharynx. Now, the tongue's not too big. Dr. Thornton, my mentor, used to call them BFTs, big fat tongues. But it's actually not the tongue's fault. It's the airway structure fault. Every time you see indentations along the side of the teeth, you're going to see a patient with uh, sleep-related breathing disorders, and you're probably going to see a restricted arch form. You're going to see a narrow maxilla, a narrow mandible, in lingual verted teeth, and not enough room for that normal-sized tongue. There is a condition called macroglossia. That's common in people like down patients, but that's not everyday patients walking into your office. What about gingivitis? Look at the picture on the bottom. Look carefully at the picture on the bottom. You, the gingivitis in the front teeth is super easy to see, but look at number 30. Look at number 19. Those gums look pretty good. Now, this is not a diagnostic picture. I get it, but, but look at those. They don't look terrible back there, do they? So what is it about this patient that's causing excessive response by the tissues in the front and not in the back? My contention is that when you see something like this, I want you to be thinking about mouth breathing. I want you to be thinking about dried out gingiva because the air is flowing over that, those front teeth and changing the microbiome, changing the inflammatory status, changing the microenvironment of those tissues around those front teeth. And so ask about hygiene, of course. Ask about breathing also. 
So what do we do for these patients? Well, it's pretty easy. If they have dry mouth or medications, we want to get them moisture. We can give them gels. We can give them little xylitol uh, stickies to go on their roof of their mouth and stimulate saliva flow. Nothing wrong with those things. That makes people feel better. It makes their, their tissues more responsive to therapy. We can go over hygiene because there are people out there that need some help with that. Not as many as, as get the help, get the advice from the hygienist, but there's a lot of people that still need to be coached a little bit on this. And of course, they may have questions about uh, electronic toothbrushes or water picks and other things that we can use. We can make uh, splints to help with wear problems. Nothing wrong with that if we diagnose it correctly. But the thing that we want, really want to do is listen to their story. Listen for what's behind the reason for that. Listen for more about their history than what we might have done before. I want you to be asking about whether they breathe through their nose. What do they feel about that? Can they breathe through their nose? And I'll show you some tips here in a little bit. Uh, and as you choose devices to make, you may choose to make something that actually addresses the airway because that may improve their tongue position such that they don't have to struggle to keep their airway open. And we can give them some adjunctive things. Those, those picture, that picture there is called myotape. And it's a little tape uh, uh, sticky that you can put over your, around your mouth. And it keeps your lips from falling open when you're passive and asleep. Makes you a better nose breather, which is a big, big deal. So we address our patient's current conditions with dental things and also an eye towards how it got that way. So when your patient comes in and has a complaint, we call it chief complaint, we can call it the thing that's bothers them the most, whatever word you use. And they might talk about their jaw joint or their headaches or their facial pain and they don't like how their teeth look. Well, I want you to also consider beyond what could be the simplest solution into the more complex one. Because the simpler ones could be muscle overuse. They could be tooth grinders, of course. Uh, the forces could be all out of balance because they, are, they have a, a posture problem. They could have a hip problem or a back problem that's causing their jaw uh, forces to be out of balance. And that's creating a, a unbalanced, uh, well, uneven forces using their closing muscles. They could have overadapted because they have a bad hip or a bad knee, and so they're working to make sure their body stays as balanced as possible, and they're showing signs of this after years of adaptive changes. So you can do something that you know how to do. This is pictures from the splint I made in C2 uh, more than a few years ago. And, um, and so we made these things to, to, to uh, identify what we can do for forces. We can give them other means of addressing forces. We, we're good at that. That's what we are trained to do. So we can find ways to address acute problems, yay. But we also want to think past that and think, okay, what could be the etiology? What's the reason for this? We can use pills. We can use Botox. We can use lots of different things we can do to help the patient because we absolutely want to help our patients. They come in, they're sore. They come in, they're unhappy. They come in, they're suffering, and they haven't found solutions yet. What is it we can do to help them? Well, do whatever you need to. Give them an anterior bite stop. Give them a Botox injection. Give them some pills if you need to. Help them right away. Make them feel better. But don't do that and think that you're solving the problem if you stop at the first few questions. Because it's not really fixing the issue if we don't identify what the triggers are. And some of those triggers are not obvious. We don't get to look at just something that say, okay, well, that, that caused that most of the time. I know when I was being trained as a dentist, it was back in the day when we thought occlusion, how the teeth fit together, triggered all these other problems. Well, that's that's no longer no uh, that's known to be no longer the case. We don't think occlusion causes all these other problems, but we do think the other problems cause occlusal issues. And if their occlusion is not balanced correctly, then if we trigger those extra muscle activities and spread the forces out incorrectly, then that can lead to other long-term adaptive changes to our patients. So it's a good thing to control those forces, but we have to first also ask, where did the forces come from? Why are they triggered? And have you ever had a patient, you made a beautiful splint on them. They, you, you adjusted this perfectly. And they come in and say, man, I, I can't wear this. I, I just, it's just not helping me at all. Nothing about this is, is it feels right. Sure. You check the fit, it fits, right? It doesn't rock. You know, you check out as quick, carefully as you can. Yeah, it fits just perfectly, but they don't like it. 
They don't like it because it impedes something else. There's something other problem that didn't show up when your first uh, clinical judgment said, I need to make a splint. So what do breathing-related sleep disturbances cause? And we think, okay, does, does obstructive sleep apnea or uh, disturbances to breathing at any level, does that cause tooth wear? Does it cause grinding? Does it cause brain responses? And we, found, we have found out now pretty definitively because of some good science and big, big uh, papers published that the breathing problems do not create tooth grinding. They don't create wear eventually. They don't create the extra muscle activity. What they do create is brain responses. And they, because brain responses are called arousals. Some of them are full arousals where you wake up. Most of them are partial arousals or micro arousals where we can trace it on an EEG signal that something changed about the brain's uh, uh, electrical response and we can track it in a temporal way with breathing problems. And we can see that, in fact, the breathing problems cause the arousal. And when we have some patients that are susceptible to this, then we can uh, track a breathing problem to a downstream problem of extra muscle activity. So the question is, is why some people, not other people? Lots of people have uh, breathing problems. Not lots of people have tooth grinding problems. And we have plenty of people with tooth grinding problems that don't have breathing problems. So why, that's why we can't uh, attach those two as cause and effect. But what we can do is be curious about what goes on and wonder, what is it that's unique about this person and not that person? I don't mean to make, make it men and women here just showed up the way I'm, when I made the slide, because it doesn't have a preponderance. And there are different levels of complaint uh, with females and males at different stages of life. But overall, the, the incidence is not that much different. So <clears throat> despite the research, and there's lots of research, but despite the research, it's so difficult to establish cause and effect that they have uh, come up with a fairly short list of suspects. But none of these are universal. None of these occur in everybody. But the two that are coming up the most common are the number of microarousals and then, yes, medications, because there are known uh, consequences of medications. And we know about some of them, SSRIs and others, that can cause extra muscle activity at nighttime. But some of them cause xerostomia, and the xerostomia can cause tooth wear. And so, so well, there's lots of ways to connect the dots here. But what we can look at, look at some of the other suspects that are listed right there. Sleep oral motor excitability. Okay, what does that mean? It means what you think it means. It means that some of the motor neurons and some people are more excitable than other people. So you send the same chemical signals to the blood system, and some of those motor neurons will be activated uh, more, more um, easily than some of the other people's. So they end up grinding their teeth. We see this in our clinics when the folks come in and they have big fat masseters because it's like they've been lifting weights with those things. And other people have little skinny flabby masseters because they've never cleansed their teeth. And uh, there's, there's, so that difference may be traced to oral motor excitability. We can have central pattern generators. If you start your life as a tooth grinder, and you may continue that way. We know that because we've traced some kids who grind their teeth and into adulthood, and the kids who have a history of grinding their teeth have an increased chance of continuing that. Now, that research is not good research because for a lot of reasons, but it is something that's in the literature that says that we can trace that through time. So that may be partly explained by the same kind of thing that allows us to sign our name the same way. We have these certain central pattern generators, and once our brains learn how to do that, they keep doing that same thing over and over again. So what's a primary care dentist to do? What's the dentist going to start with? We're going to manage the forces. We're going to make sure that the forces aren't overwhelming the patient's uh, ability to adapt so we can make them more comfortable. So we make them a splint of some type. 
any any style that you want. That's just a representative thing. But you make them some kind of a uh, device that allows them to clinch down on it or grind back and forth on it or whatever else they're going to do to it. But yet the forces are controlled because we have the ability to do that by a proper analysis, by proper uh, adjustments, by proper observing of response. And then the other thing we can do is we can reduce arousals. So if you have a patient who's proven to have a breathing-related sleep disorder, we want to reduce those arousals. We do that in part by coaching them on sleep hygiene. We make sure that they have a dark, cool room to sleep in. If they're if it's the baby being a problem, you're not going to get anybody to reduce their baby arousals until the baby doesn't arouse them anymore. So you just live with what they got for a little while. So you deal with the patients where they are in life. Uh, but we can do something to reduce the arousals on folks that have a breathing-related sleep disorder. We can make appliances that help them with that, with that, uh, th th those arousals by smoothing out the interruptions to breathing, like obstructive sleep apnea, or snoring. So we, as we choose which device we might need to make for them, we better know what their arousal status is. We better know if they have a intermittent hypoxemia problem. We better know if they have some form of sleep-related breathing disorder that might be diagnosable and therefore able to address by moving the jaw forward, not just supported with a, a centric relation splint, but forward somewhere to clear the airway so they don't have those arousal interruptions to sleep, the thing that was on that, that chart earlier. But the most important thing that dentists, the primary care dentists can do is be curious. And if you see a symptom, I caution you against that uh, uh, confirmation bias that we all have. When somebody comes in and they say, man, my jaw's hurt, and I, I wake up with a headache, and, uh, and you look in there and the teeth have wear on them, you know, your first thing you may have in your head is, well, let's make a bite splint. Let's make a supporting guard, whatever name you put on it. Okay, that's, that may be exactly the right thing to do. But the best physicians will be curious about, could there be anything else that we should be thinking about? And in a very simple example, ask them about their snoring. Ask them about whether they've ever been diagnosed with a breathing disorder. Are they supposed to be using a CPAP? Before you make a bite splint and have them come back and say, you know what, this is I can't wear this. They may not be able to tell you that it's causing their breathing to be worse, but they can tell you that they don't like it. So. You make If you see a symptom and you think you have a diagnosis straight away because it's the same symptom you've seen in 100 other people, stay curious. And when you do the treatment, and you, again, you may make them a protective guard for their teeth, be sure to ask more questions. Make sure it confirms the diagnosis. Make sure the diagnosis correlates with the symptoms. And be continuously curious about your patient's responses to the treatment you have, and you'll be much, much better at matching patients to the right treatment. So that's that's kind of getting through the jaw joint problems, the, the breathing-related problems. But let's look at what we can do to help our patients become just better physiology, better breathers. Because we can help them breathe better at nighttime in a number of different ways. I showed you myotape. We can keep mouth closed. We can I showed you an oral one example of an oral appliance. We can certainly keep that jaw from falling backwards and crowding the airway. But what about the daytime? Do people breathe badly in the daytime and cause the central pattern generators to be not efficient enough to keep the airway open at nighttime? That's turning out to be true as well. So if we can help people breathe better in the daytime, we can set their brains up to be more uh, capable of handling disruptions in other parts of sleep and uh, other parts of their life, including sleep. If you've read the book Breath by James Nestor, and I, I think everybody that breathes should read the book Breath by James Nestor, you will see that daytime uh, problems translate into nighttime problems as well. And one of those things is nose breathing. And I'm a huge nose breathing fan. I think that's the only place we need to be breathing through for most part. I mean, I get it when we have colds, but the science is clear that the nose is directly connected to the limbic system. When I studied the nose in dental school, I tried to identify where the pins were and what a turban it was. 
but the cranial nerve one, which was is the nas olfactory nerve, uh, was told to me to be well. That's just for telling what your environment is like, and you know what's out there. Are you smelling danger? Are you smelling something you can eat? Are you smelling something you can mate with? That's kind of the functions of the olfactory nerve. It goes pretty directly to the cortex, so you can make decisions. Well, what the science has shown now is there's electrical signals that pass from specialized cells in the nose directly into the limbic system. And the limbic system has all those parts that you see there on that graphic. That's central brain stuff. And what happens in the center of the brain in the limbic system, it controls our autonomic nervous system. It controls it by filtering uh, sensory uh, signals from the rest of the body and proprioceptive signals. It filters those into the cortex so we know where our body parts are and how we can use them. It, it filters decisions we can make in our cortex or our subcortex down into the autonomic nervous system, which controls how our bodies work. And that limbic system also controls memory, it controls emotions, it controls sight, it controls lots of different things. It's a it's the central uh, waypoint for all the electrical activity of the brain. And for some reason, there are electrical signals directly from the nasal mucosa to, into the middle of this limbic system. I don't have time to tell you how we know that, but we know that for a hundred percent fact. And there are none of those same signals that pass from mouth breathing. So the only way to send the signals that the brain needs into the limbic system is to breathe through your nose, not through your mouth. That means nose breathing is kind of important. So how do you know if somebody can breathe through their nose well enough? Real simple. If you ask somebody, How, how's your nose breathing? They'll say, that's fine. Why will they say that? They'll say that because, hey, you're the dentist, and what do you care about noses? And you, that was a kind of a strange question, so how can I get out of this conversation as easy as possible? But they'll also say it because they are used to the amount of work it takes to breathe properly through their nose. So they know, uh, how, they don't know, their autonomic nervous system knows that if they have to work the diaphragm this hard to overcome the restrictions in their particular nasal situation whether it be a deviated septum or a chronic rhinitis or whatever the case is, they breathe the way that they breathe. And they have no way to know that there's an easier or more difficult way to breathe. So what do you do? The way to, to test and see what kind of trouble they're in is to just simply have them put something over their lips or finger for two minutes. If they can breathe calmly and easily for two minutes with something touching their lips, you can't just have them hold their lips together, put their finger on their lips for two minutes, they're likely not to have much of a nose breathing problem. Now, if they struggle, if they have to breathe deeper, faster, if they get, have signs of stress, if their heart rate goes up, if they just know that that was tough for them to do, well, there's something that can be improved about their nose breathing. So that's simple, two minutes and, you, and you're done with that. This might be handy if you're planning a lot of res restorations and you're going to use a rubber dam. So that if they can't breathe through their nose, you might be able to put them on medications or something to clear their nose. Afrin's excellent for that. If you're going to have a restorative quadrant with rubber dam going on, or even say, for example, periscaling, where there's a lot of activity and there's not a ton of time for them to stop and interrupt the hygienist to get a good restorative uh, thing going on there. So if they can't breathe through their nose, they're poor dental patients. So a little Afrin uh, and clears their nose and it's good to go. Uh, if they can breathe normally, they don't maybe need that. But going this in advance can make everything more comfortable for your restorative patient care. So uh, Patrick McCowan is a physiologist from Ireland, and he's kind of our global leader in breathing. He's studied more about this. He coaches all over the world. He coaches Coldplay, the band, on how to breathe better on stage. Now, how cool is that, right? And so he, he came up with uh, a whole lot of things to tell us about, but I'm going to tell you about three of them. And the tenets of breathing, well, like four of them, the tenets of breathing well include these things. And we can all do this tonight while we're on this webinar. We're going to learn how to breathe light, we're going to learn how to breathe deep, and we're going to learn how to breathe slow, because that supports these aspects of our physiology. And each one of those has a major plus for making sure our breathing is the optimum through the all of our activities, daytime and nighttime. And if you get to be a great breather in the daytime, your breathing will improve 
at night. This will not cure your snoring and your sleep apnea. But what it will do is it will might keep you from developing those. And certainly it will make you more conscious of those things. So what does that mean? So let's look at what breathe light means. Breathe light is the reduced volume in something called creating air hunger. And our goal here is to re increase our brain's CO2 tolerance. Now, our brains are uh, sensitive to the oxygen CO2 balance in our blood. Of course, we know that and as you know, we're trained that way. And CO2 is the major trigger. So intermittent hypoxia is not the major trigger for the respiratory cycles. It's, in, it's hypercapnia. And if we are very sensitive to hypercapnia, we're going to breathe faster. We're going to breathe uh, quicker, and that can lead us into uh, poor gas balance and some other bad things. So what we have learned over the many years is that breathing lightly can increase our CO2 tolerance. So the exercise goes like this, and you can follow right along with me and do it yourself right there in your chair. And sit up nice and straight. Patrick says, it's, imagine there's a string in the top of your head pulling it towards the ceiling. So you got a good posture, and you're nice and straight. And all you'll do is make sure your lips are closed. There's always going to be a nose breathing here through these exercises. And you breathe as lightly as you can, such that you can't really even feel the air moving through your nose. So very lightly, and you do that for two minutes. Now, we're not going to do that for two minutes because I don't have two minutes, but that's the exercise. You do that for two minutes, breathing very lightly. You can try it, just very, just almost, almost imperceptible air movement. At this stage, you don't have to uh, concentrate on how deep you breathe, just breathe. And what I want you to be feeling when you do these exercises for real is that you wish you could breathe a little more. That's called air hunger. And exactly like every other exercise that we ever do, that as you uh, do this more, you'll, that air hunger will fade. And then you'll feel it with lighter and lighter air. And that's ch changing your body's CO2 tolerance. The next one is called breathe deep. Now, in our bodies, we have two different major muscle groups that fill our lungs. The primary one's the diaphragm. The secondary ones are the intercostal muscles of our chest. So diaphragmatic breathing is, has a ton of different benefits. Making sure that you breathe with your diaphragm, deep with your diaphragm, it does a few things. One thing it does is it increases intra-abdominal pressure. As your diaphragm pulls itself downwards, opening a, a negative pressure in your thorax to fill your lungs, it pushes into your abdomen. When it does that, that increases gut motility. It also makes the other muscles respond, like the ones around your back, like the ones at your pelvis. So when your diaphragm moves downwards, increasing intra-abdominal pressure, pelvic muscles and back muscles uh, stiffen to balance that force. Well, you do that properly, and those pelvic and back muscles stabilize your core. And when that happens, you have good posture. Poor posture keeps the diaphragm from working properly. So the way to practice bre breathing deep is you put your hands on your sides. Again, sit up nice and straight. You can stand up if you want. Sit uh, by your sides and feel your last two ribs. And when you breathe slowly, lightly and slowly, what I want you to feel is those last two ribs uh, expanding. The reason why you want to look, feel those two ribs is because the diaphragm attaches above those ribs. And so the muscles aren't moving those ribs. What's happening is intra-abdominal pressure is pushing out on those ribs. So it's a surrogate. It's actually a direct result of intra-abdominal pressure. And that has all those other good things. So hands on your lower ribs, breathe deep so you can feel those ribs expand. And you do that for two minutes as well. And then you start to practice your breathing lightly while you're breathing deeply. And you can feel that expansion and a little bit of air hunger to go with it. The third exercise is to breathe slow. Now, this is a cadence issue. This is a, uh, a timing issue. So here, as you breathe lightly and you breathe deeply, you breathe in for a count of four, then you kind of hold it for a second, 
Then you breathe out for a count of six and you hold it for a second and then in for a count of four and out for a count of six, holding it in between the inspiration and the expiration. This will add up to six breaths per minute. Now, when we were in, um, when I, I remember from physiology class that 12 to 20 breaths a minute was normal. Well, that may be normal, but that's not the best health. Six breaths per minute is the best health. So as you practice this, you will practice cadence. And why is that the best health? Because it calms the autonomic nervous system, sends the right signals to the vagus nerve, sends the right signals to the rest of the ANS and your feedback loops in your brain for how comfortable you are, how calm you are, how capable you are of handling the challenges of life get better when your cadence is down to about six breaths per minute. Now, you can't always do this. Of course, you know, if I'm not doing that now while I'm talking to you because I'm busy working. But if you're sitting at your desk reading, if you're uh, seeing patients and you're concentrating at your, at your patients, if your ANS is nice and calm, you can focus better. So practice your breathing while you're not talking with your patients and you're doing restorative dentistry, while you're doing hygiene, while you're doing uh, your afternoon exercise, all those things you can do. Oh, well, let me say something about exercise real, real quick. Is that Patrick is saying what you should do now is for the, the um, intensity of your exercise, elliptical machine, running, walking, whatever it is that you do. He says what you should do is the maximum exercise you can do always keeping your mouth closed now if you're on a team and you have maximum uh you know effort required you know the hockey playoffs are going on the nba playoffs are going on if you're playing those things well you're going to need to open your mouth but if you're just trying to find your limit of a non-professional level go to the limit that you can do by keep with and keep your lips together all the time. I'll show you an extreme example of that coming up. So three things, breathe light, breathe deep and breathe slow will get you to a excellent breathing patterns. What else can you do to measure your response, your, your ability to manage carbon dioxide, your ability to make a difference in how your tolerance goes, your ability to decrease your intermittent hypoxia. Well, he came up with another test called the Brain Carbon Dioxide Level Tolerance Test. Well, that's a lousy name because you can't say Brain Carbon Dioxide Level Tolerance Test very quickly. And certainly the acronym means nothing. So what he, he renamed it years ago and he said, well, okay, let's call it the BOLT test, Body Oxygen Level Test. Well, it really doesn't have much to do with body oxygen levels. It has to do with carbon dioxide tolerance. So the better term for this now is called control pause. And what the control pause is, is you are testing for when your body is signaling it's time to breathe. And how you do that is very simple. You, you, you're sitting quietly, you're sitting straight, you're sitting, you're ready to go, and you breathe in through your nose and out through your nose a few times. Get just a normal cadence, your six cadence per minute. Whatever is normal for you, you breathe in and out a few times. And then you breathe out a comfortable amount. You're not trying to empty your throat. None of these movements are extreme here. You just breathe out, breathe out, make a full expiration. And then you pinch your nose. Very important. You pinch your nose. And then you wait for your body to tell you it's time to breathe again. This is not a, a, a contest for how long you can hold your breath. It's a contest for being aware of when your body signals that it's time to breathe again. When does that CO2 tolerance make you start the respiratory cycles? So you sit upright, you breathe in and out a few times, you breathe out, you hold your nose, and you time it. And time it for, with you know, your watch or whatever system you're using and see how many seconds until you feel, I got to breathe. Now, not your maximum, I must breathe, not the first little hint that says, yeah, I guess I shouldn't be holding my breath now. But when do you have to breathe? So it's very subjective, but it's not, the, the number is not that important. The number is, should be, uh, you should be able to affect the number. So how do you do that? By the way, 40 seconds is on it because athletes get the 40 seconds without any problem. Now, remember, 
It's not maximum breath hold time. It's when does the body tell you it's time to breathe? Very important difference. So what if your control pause was, was very short? What if it was under 10 seconds? Not, not uncommon. And so what you, how you affect that, how you increase your CO2 tolerance is by practicing. And so what you do is it's called many small breaths. You, you just hold your breath. You, put, you pinch your nose. You never can, be, by the way, be effective just voluntarily holding your breath. It's always better to hold your nose, finger on your lips, whatever it is you have to do. So you, you just pinch your nose for two to five seconds. And then you breathe normally for 10 seconds. And then you keep doing that over and over and over again for about three minutes. And then you repeat that several times a day. So you say, oh, man, I don't have time for that. Yes, you do. You can do that while you're driving. You can do that while you're sitting at work, reading something. You can do that while you're listening to boring webinars. You can do it all kinds of things that you're doing. And so, so you can find time to do these little exercises. By the way, that's also the best way to decongest your nose for a lot of re other reasons I don't have time to talk to you about. The other thing you can do is you can walk uh, slowly with that. Five to 10 paces is all. Five or 10 steps up and down the hallway, holding your nose, and then rest for 30 seconds. And then do that a bunch of times through the daytime. Uh, and so that will do the same kind of thing. Now, what if your control pause was a little longer, 10 to 15 seconds? Now you can start to add more movement. So you can breathe light doing that exercise 10 minutes at a time for three times a day. So find 10 minutes and just breathe lightly. Try and increase that air hunger portion of things for a significant amount of time and do that a few times a day. And you'll get better and better and better at this. You can add a few walking, a little bit of walking there. So you add a little bit more body uh, CO2 uh, generation and see how you can do with that. And then you can also practice your slow and deep, you know, uh, 10 minutes a day. So you just basically you're just increasing the movement portion, which does what increases your CO2. And if you're greater than 15 seconds and you want to do uh, kind of get up into the 25, 35, 45 second range, you have to just do more of it. So uh, when you're warming up, after you exhale, hold your breath, create a medium air hunger. Now, when we were learning to breathe lightly, I said, get a little bit of air hunger. Make sure you feel that you need to breathe. Well, if you're going to try and increase this, now you go for a little bit more. So just like exercise, if you don't push yourself, you don't get better. If you're trying to increase your air hunger, go for a little bit more necessity to breathe, which is air hunger, and just get used to that. Be comfortable with that. Acknowledge it. Think about it. Meditate on it. And your brain will accept it over time. And then again, slow and deep while walking more and more and more. And by the way, when you have a breathing exercise and you've exhaled and you've held your nose, the next movement needs to be inhalation. Make sure that you exhale first and then inhale when you stop holding your nose. Why? Because your body is generating tons of nitric oxide in your sinuses while you're not breathing. And if you breathe in first after an exercise or, a, or a, uh, an event like this, then you pull more of that nitric oxide deeper into your lungs and that's healthy for you. So don't make, make sure you don't waste that nitric oxide by holding your breath and in the first move to be breathing out. Always inhale after any of these things. So Barry Raphael, my uh, orthodontic colleague in Art New Jersey said this, first make it easy for them to breathe. So he expands our little uh, craniofacial respiratory complexes and big ones too. And then we teach them how to breathe easily. So that's, a, that's what we're doing. We're As dentists, we're paying attention to the craniofacial respiratory complex. And then we're also teaching them how to breathe. So my friend, Bill Hang, He's older than 75. I'm not sure exactly how old Bill is, but he's older than 75. And he just posted this on Facebook, 11 Boston marathons, 34 marathons overall. And he ran, just ran the Boston marathon a few weeks ago with his lips taped shut the entire time, except when he was drinking. And he took a breath through his nose every 15 strides. Now, I have no comparison with my life to Bill Hang's life. He's done that, you know, so uh, for so long. But look what can be accomplished with the kind of work that James Nestor, out of the book Breath, Patrick McCowan, one of his books is called Oxygen Advantage. 
And uh, these people can train us with diligent work uh, to be better breathers. Because really, uh, like Kevin Quishan says, it's a thinking person's game. As we imagine our own physiology, as we imagine our patient's physiology, as we are curious about do the symptoms match the diagnosis, match the treatment, match the symptoms, as we help our patients do all of this, we have to continually think about this. And we start at the youngest ages. So I got to pitch the ADA Children's Airway event. It's, uh, it's uh, called Kids Don't Grow Out of It. They Need Your Help. And here's how. We're going to talk about it. We're going to put your hands on the devices. We're going to help you identify what specifically you can do for little kids in your practice so they don't, don't have to grow up and be as hardworking as Bill Hang to, to breathe through their nose for a marathon. They can do this naturally. They don't have to work to breathe light, breathe deep, and breathe slow because they do it all the time. They don't have to work on their control pause because their CO2 is controlled by their brains. They don't have to compensate and end up with lifetimes of intermittent hypoxia. We can do that because we're dentists and we can do it because we're primary care dentists. So that's just one of the things that little QR code down there is how you can go to the registration side, I think. And so if you want to learn some more, AAPMD, American Academy of Physiologic Medicine and Dentistry, is a, a collection of professionals, med physicians, physical therapists, myofunctional therapists, speeches, dentists, all these people are coming together to talk to, to each other. AADSM.org is our is, is the, um, the major organization for dentists doing adult sleep apnea troubles. Uh, and, and they don't do much with kids, but they do a lot. And like I said, the magazine, if you, if you are interested in the subject, go to dentalsleeppractice.com and see what you think. Um, and if you like it, then subscribe. Um, yeah, those kind of things. And then, uh, then here's my contact information uh, for me down there. If you have any questions, I love to answer questions. So not just tonight, but because uh, I ran too long, like I told Desi I would. And uh, but there's uh, you can reach me. And at Panky, I'm doing a few things for Panky. I'm I'm actually very happy. I'm going to be part of the every, every E1 class now. So I get to be uh, I'll do a little talk like this for every E1 class. And I'm very excited about that because it, we get a chance to think about airway from the first days of Panky. And then I've got two more Panky events on Fridays uh, coming up where I'm gonna talk a whole lot more about the role of dentists in healthcare as the primary care dentist. And then also in November, we're gonna go deep into why nose breathing affects general health. And you can't be a, in good health if you're not breathing through your nose. So we're going to talk in de, uh, for a few hours about both of those things coming up later this year. And uh, and I look forward to seeing all of you guys at uh, Panky sometime and some other place sometime. And away we go.